act that nets the highest ROI as we see the, the tipping point of it become, becoming easier on the mobile platform, then, then we'll see that change from the PC to the mobile device itself. So, so why won't mobile threats matter? Um, we're, we're skeptical people. We like skeptical Wait, people. John, security people aren't skeptical. <laughs> so, so constantly we hear, okay, well, why, why, why should we even care about this? So mobile being fragmented is, is, a, is something we hear constantly. And, and I agree, mobile is fragmented. But when we look at today's world, how many devices are out there and how rapidly they're shipping, I mean, even a year ago, there was very, very few Android devices. It's absolutely exploding. There's nearly 150,000 to 200,000 Android devices shipping every single day. So when you think about, yes, Windows is this kind of um, singular platform that, 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 that it's easier to attack, there's going to be three Windows or four Windows in terms of equivalent size and single OSs. So when we look at that, you have iPhone, you have Blackberry, you have Android, there's going to be um, something that actually forgoes that fragmentation. In terms of sandboxing, yes, there's a sandbox, but sandbox doesn't always mean safe. And in, in what we've seen OS vendors implement generally is, is great thinking and we're, we're super on board with the, with the approach. We just want to make sure that people are tempered in their understanding of, of what's possible and what's not. And then in terms of attack surface, I mean, the attack surface Yes, in the context of mobile could be looked at as small, but then you look at things like push services being implemented, messaging services. It, it's really becoming easier and easier um, to attack a whole host of things, ranging from the SMS protocol to things on the device itself to third-party services interacting. Um, and, and we're seeing examples of this with third-party web-based services interacting with things on the mobile device that then serve as a vector. So we may find web-based exploits actually enabling compromise of the mobile device itself. It's the question of why, why did we go do all this again? Um, ultimately, our goal is to keep people safe. Um, I imagine that's why a lot of people do security research is to, to help people better understand things, um, especially in this kind of brave new world of mobile. Uh, we think it is different from the PC, and we think the approaches are probably going to be different from the PC. And I, I think for everyone involved in this, good data will lead to good decisions. And you know, this is our small uh, contribution to good data. Uh, what we want to be able to also do is identify threats in the wild. The vulnerability we talked about before, that's, you know, finding things like that, um, you know, whether it be apps that are vulnerable or actual exploitation going on, uh, that, that's really important to us. Um, you know, it's also kind of interesting to look at, because platforms take different security models, and to be clear, you know, different security mo modules, or different security models does not necessarily mean more or less secure, they just mean different. And, uh, and one of the you know, opinions that I have is that threats will evolve with respect to the security model and we can look into the data and, and see why we think that as well. Uh, and also, we want to see what apps are actually doing. Um, and as we know that this is not always the same thing that things say they're doing. Uh, and having data to actually help us identify things in the wild that are, have some sort of mismatches is good. Uh, and now we're going to go over uh, quickly how we, or how we actually built this thing. Um, quick to orient everyone, there's three main pieces here that we want to talk about. One, uh, we built a distributed crawler. Um, it speaks Android Market and Apple App Store, uh, so it talks directly to these, uh, these marketplaces and uh, gets metadata and downloads applications. We have a persistent data store, so we can actually analyze things as soon as we get them, or we can analyze them offline, if, for example, if we have a question we want to ask every mobile app that we've ever encountered. And we also built uh, custom analysis tools uh, because there's really not too much out there to analyze mobile devices, um, especially when we have talking a lot of OS-specific capabilities that play into the security model pretty heavily. So the crawler. Um, we decided to build the distributed crawler. Um, we, we first started uh, as just kind of a single-threaded uh, crawler, and we quickly found that analyzing every mobile app in the world uh, can't do in one thread. Uh, so we basically, we have a job queue, and uh, we, we have multiple jobs that can each queue other jobs. So first, we go enumerate applications. And this is actually a lot like you going to browse the app store yourself. So you might go browse a category, and we'll see a whole list of applications. That's the enumeration step. Uh, depending on the app store, uh, we may have another step to go actually pull metadata. So imagine you're browsing a category, you list all the applications, and you click on the applications, or one, a specific application, and you get a whole bunch of data about it. That's the second step. And the third step is, if it's a free application, we can actually have our crawler go and download it. 
And uh, this thing, it's, it's built in Ruby, and uh, right now it's, uh, it's talking to two app stores, but uh, you know, don't be surprised to see it talking to more in the future. And you, you can see how powerful this is. I mean, you know, we first started just by doing manual research and looking at mobile applications. That's clearly not scalable. Kevin and I, uh, there's not enough Red Bull to, to, to fuel that. Um, oh, but we try. <laughs> but when we look at actually scaling that and being able to, in real time, look at every version of every application hitting in real time, not only being able to analyze threats as they come, but threats when we find new research to go look back historically at what happened and what was there, then this truly becomes a powerful tool. So once we have the data, um, we're storing the application metadata so we can actually go search it and do all sorts of fun stuff with it. Um, we're storing that in MySQL. Uh, application binaries we're putting on the file system. Um, if you want to find the fastest way to my make MySQL cry, uh, throw a whole bunch of binary data into it. We didn't do that, but I, I, in projects past I had tried. Don't. Um, and we're also tracking changes over time. So imagine we have an application and you have ten different versions of it. You know, one, one potential threat vector is you have a great application, you wait till a million people download it, then you turn it evil. Right? So, download 100,000 applications. What's next? What are we going to do with all this stuff? So, we built uh, some tools. As, as John said, we quickly ran out of Red Bull uh, analyzing these all ourselves. Uh, we built some custom static analysis tools to actually look at the application binaries. So when we say we have a data set, uh, we're specifically talking uh, nearly 300,000 total applications, but 100, nearly 100,000 application binaries uh, that are active in the marketplace right now. Uh, and we're pulling in interesting data out of them. You know, the first is uh, classes, classes and methods reference. So these are API functions that the framework or the platform provides. We're looking at what sort of things are actually implemented in the code. Uh, on Android in particular, we're looking at permissions that the, the application has. And then also, you know, any sort of strings that are, the, that are in the application. They're sometimes helpful to look at. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Android first. So uh, not only is Dalvik in Iceland, it's also in your phone if you have an Android phone. Uh, Dalvik is a virtual machine uh, that's optimized for mobile. It's actually a really cool piece of technology and, and you can read, spend hours reading about it, not that I've done that. Uh, and it's effectively like a Java virtual machine with some kind of unimportant differences for our analysis here. Um, the applications that you download on Android, for example, they are APKs. Uh, this is actually very similar to a jar format if you've ever seen a jar. Um, and a jar is basically just a zip. Uh, and the main executable inside of an APK is called classes.dex. And this is an executable that runs in the Dalvik virtual machine. The other really important thing inside of an Android application is what's called the uh, Android Manifest.xml. Uh, it's a binary encoded XML document. Uh, it's a proprietary format, uh, not exactly fun to parse, but there is, uh, you can, there's Android framework code that can parse it for you if you need to do that. Um, it describes the permissions that an application has and the application components. And there are some things that are really unique about the Android runtime that actually make uh, this manifest fairly authoritative and important. And I think for, for, to understand how we did the analysis, let me go for kind of a brief dive in the Android security model. Uh, they did something very innovative. And that's four declared permissions that are very granular for specific capabilities. So when you install an app, all of the permissions that app can or will be able to use are declared and they're in front of you. And you get to say yes or no. This is different from a model where you either don't see what an app is doing or you're prompted to ask at a later time. And I think this, this is a great feature of, of the Android platform itself. Um, another really important point um, that I think uh, the, uh, these aren't the uh, permissions you're looking for talk, uh, hit everyone and I'm going to hit you guys over the head with it again. Android permissions and in, in security is enforced at the process level not the VM level. If you find a way to escape the VM and run something native, that's not an exploit, that's the point. Um, that, that's how Android works and it actually, it, it, it solves a lot of problems because, hey, we can, write nat we can run native libraries. We're not stuck writing Java and Dalvik. We can throw stuff to C if we need to. Hell, we can just throw stuff to shellcode, ARM shellcode if we need to. And that's all within the Android permission model. The other nice thing about this is the Android permission model is the Unix permission model. Uh, you're a process. If you know, if that process needs to access the internet, it just has uh, permission to access the internet on the Unix level. It's, it's, it's actually quite nice. So with, with that in mind, you know, how did we actually analyze applications? So the, the first step is uh, lo looking at package permissions. It is a great kind of gating factor on, 
on what Android applications can do. Uh, we're, we're going to assume that applications respect the permissions and that we're not talking about a root vulnerability here. Uh, if we have a root vulnerability, we have bigger problems on our hand than, than whether it that respects the permission model. Uh, and we also do Dalvik static analysis to, to extract a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and an example question we might ask an app is, does it have a specific permission and does it reference this specific API in its classes.dex file? Uh, and when we actually define questions, we, we define heuristics eff uh, effectively. Um, if we want to know if a device uh, reads the device's phone or an application reads the device's phone number, we say, okay, does it have the read phone state permission? And does it, does it reference the telephony manager get line one number? Or we can run other arbitrary analysis on the fly. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we, we want to declare what the analysis we can do and what, where the future work is. Um, and as we've said, you know, apps shouldn't be able to exceed declared permissions. Um, but if we, if we know specific vulnerabilities, we can look for those as separate things. Uh, also, capabilities can be implemented outside of Dalvik. So native code can implement, uh, interact directly with the IPC mechanism on Android. And, you know, apps can pull code directly from the internet. So, you know, we're obviously not going to be looking at uh, code that's pulled directly from the internet uh, when we're analyzing a, a binary statically. Um, we're also not looking at evasive code. If a code is, is basically uh, encrypting itself or modifying itself in some way, the analysis we're doing right now is not looking for that. Uh, also, raw IPC calls. So if you're hitting binder directly, that, that's not in the heuristics we're looking at today. We're looking at the vast majority of apps who use the Android framework and are interacting with it. And, and of course, as we kind of move on into the future, there will be you know, a near infinite amount of work to get more insight into bad things that are happening. So as we mentioned, we also looked at iPhone. Uh, the iPhone security model is, is fairly simple. There's process level sandboxing uh, and it's what I'll call app store API enforcement. Um, namely that in order to get into the app store, you have to do the right thing. You have to not use protected APIs uh, and you have to use APIs in a way that uh, Apple deems good. Um, which is not always a 100% silver bullet solution, but uh, it works a lot of times. Um, and also, uh, interestingly enough, they do have uh, ask for certain uh, capabilities, namely location and push. So uh, even though an application accesses the location API, it won't actually, actually access your location unless the user confirms that you can. So like an APK, uh, uh, iPhone applications are really just zip files. Uh, the application binary is a mock O executable, which is the same executable format on OS, OS X. Um, and it's typically in the payload, uh, and there's app name dot app, which is the OS X and iPhone application package convention. And there'll be a mock O binary right inside of that. A quick uh, detour into what uh, mock O is so you can kind of understand how we did the analysis. Uh, specifically, the mock O header has a series of load commands. Uh, load commands specify how the binary is segmented, uh, what sort of libraries we're linking against at runtime, uh, if there are encrypted sections. Um, some segments in Mako uh, text is typically where executable code or read only constants are located. Uh, data is where writable data is. Uh, and then the link edit table is where we have all of our dynamic linker and symbol data. Uh, if you guys have analyzed uh, PE, a portable executable format, on Windows or other platforms, uh, there's this confusion of section versus segment. Uh, in PE, the top level splitting of a binary is a section. In Mach O, the top level splitting is called a segment, and a segment has many sections. Totally confusing. I don't know why they chose to do it that way, but segment is bigger than section. Uh, one of the problems that you know, we have to deal with when we're analyzing iPhone apps is iPhone apps are encrypted. You know, this is DRM. This is to prevent people from pirating apps. Not that it has stopped people from pirating apps, but that's the intention. Uh, so what, I think to understand how encryption works, let's look at how a typical Mako executable looks. Um, the three LC segments you see, those are the top level segmentation load commands. And on the left side, you see the flat file. Um, it's, you know, it's just a string of bits. And so uh, what we're, what we're uh, showing right here is the first step that the Mako loader in the kernel takes to basically map this file into memory. And so basically it takes the segment commands and looks at the file data 
and the target VM addresses and it just maps them over. Uh, a lot of times you may have a larger VM space than your file space. For example, if you have really large unallocated buffers.